Hello there, Tando Book Club lovers. We are so happy to have you join us as we talk to African female authors about their books and the stories behind them. As is our custom, we always begin every episode with a quote from a famous African that we believe captures the spirit and message of the author we'll be interviewing. Today's quote is, Africans, they're tired. They're tired of being the subject of everybody's charity and care. We are grateful, but we know that we can take charge of our own destinies if we have the will to reform. And that quote is from Ngozi Okonjo Iweala, Director General of the World Trade Organization. This quote sums up what our guest today embodies with respect to her work and desire to empower others financially. Meet Shalom Goero, a trainer, speaker, e-facilitator and coach in social finance. With accreditation from the International Labour Organization, she trains in various financial education and business courses in Zimbabwe and the region. Shalom has featured on various weekly local radio programs for the past three years and authored the book, The Personal Finance Game Plan, a must-have for Zimbabwean young people starting their financial journeys. She is also a Zimtrade consultant, facilitating financial management sessions for SMEs preparing for export. As a member of Global Shapers Harare Hub, she leads the Shaped Financial Literacy Project aimed at financial education for youth in schools. She has written for publications such as the Sunday Mail, Nzira Magazine, and Bulawayo 24. She is also a trained e-facilitator and has trained 5,000 and over participants through various online financial literacy courses curated for the Zimbabwean market. Shalom, welcome. Thank you very much. It's lovely to be here. We're so happy to have you here. Now, you first appeared on the book club in March, and I did say to you, I was definitely going to have you back. Yes. And we were talking before and you were like, I didn't believe. Well, I hope you believe now. I do. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> so starting with the interview, why did you first start writing? So for me, it came out of a conversation I had with a client. So I train um, WhatsApp classes often. And um, I, I had given myself a target to write one blog article on personal finance issues uh, once every month. So it was kind of like a challenge that I set up. I think this was um, 2019 and I was just trying it out. Then my very first article hit a nerve and one, one client came to my inbox and said, hey, I think you should consider writing a book. You really know how to sort of like break down, you know, um, financial concepts and make them relatable in written form. And we like the way you've written this particular uh, article consider it and I kind of laughed at it because I thought ah, I'm not really a writer I'm more of a trainer more of a speaker I love just talking that's that's what I enjoy doing um, and I just thought you know writing okay maybe maybe in the future and then I ignored it and then I had someone again say to, to me again I think in, an, in another conversation and it's it started to kind of grow on me and I spoke to a few other colleagues and friends who know my work and they said hey we've been thinking about this too you should definitely take it up and that's how the book came to be so it came out of conversations and then I thought this is actually a good idea so the blog articles morphed into the book that's very interesting I think um, it's um, interesting using the written word to bring illumination and enlightenment mm -hmm. around numbers um, and also because numbers can be so intimidating for many people because we associate it with maths, yet we're spending money and receiving money every day of our lives. That's true. Um, so I think that that's very interesting about people who write about money, <laughs> demystifying it. So the blog's morphing into books. What did that process look like? Because it's one thing writing a blog for the month. It's another thing making that into something that can be developed and well thought out and fleshed out into a book. What did that process look like for you? So two things. Initially, when I set out to write the book, um, I, had, I had very big ideas, very ambitious of me, I think. 
Um, and I, I sort of came up with a, with a very big, ambitious title, something that I wanted to write about. And then as I wrote, I think I wrote like a, the first chapter and I thought, this is not working out. Let me go back to the blog articles that I'd been writing. So I went back there and I, I realized that there was a theme that had kind of formulated as I wrote. And I thought, I actually have content here. Let me put these together, but take more time on each topic. So like you said, when it's a blog article, it's also quite shortened because you're trying to do a lot of things maybe in like on one page. Um, and I also had, you know, blogs that I'd been writing for magazines, for newspaper articles, you know, so they had, you know, strict sort of uh, word limits. But I, to I took those and I thought, let me continue with the story behind all of these articles. And then also the second thing was from radio, there are a lot of conversations that happen on radio. So when I'm doing my shows on radio, there's a lot of back and forth. The people will send you messages. The people will ask you real life questions and you have to think of solutions and all of that. And I thought, ah, let me also add those frequently asked questions, mm -hmm. but then put them in the context of the book. So if I'm talking about goal setting, what are some of the frequently asked questions and then handle them in the book. So it was, I got my inspiration from those two places and then began to write. So a lot of it was, oh, actually, I think I've got this article. Let me put this here and then let me flesh it out um, with the stories of people. And then my own stories, I got an opportunity to really talk about things that I have done and then things that my friends have done. So it really just kind of sort of flow, you know, just flowed out of that. Um, and then the book was born from that. Definitely. I love the fact that your book traces your personal stories, um, like throughout your whole life, right? Um, uh, I think which highlights our lifelong relationship with money and finance and what that accrues or parlays into from a perspective of wealth generation and transferable wealth. Um, but I also love that it was um, the process of helping other people and those people's responses that led you on your journey and kind of like taught you and said, wait here, this is the thing to press in on. This is the thing to flesh out. Um, and you know for sure, it's kind of like market research or beta readers, you know for sure that the content is actually going to work and you know people are, are hungry for it. That's it. So in terms of writing about finance as an African woman, um, traditionally, women are n more seen than heard, um, especially when it comes to the big power issues in the house, of which money is one. Why did you choose as an African female to write about finance to even begin the journey um, of financial literacy and empowerment of other people in that vein? Wow, good question. Most of it is rooted in my mother's story. So she's a single, uh, she was a single mom for 18 years. Um, and she, she's well known in the finance space. She's a microfinance uh, expert. And in our home, um, you know, as a single mom, uh, she was very strong willed and, and, and very disciplined about money issues. And she taught me uh, money issues from a young age. And it's, it's something that became sort of part and parcel of our household conversations. So I didn't think it weird until I actually stepped outside and realized, <laughs> oh, actually, these conversations are not had that common mm -hmm. you know what i mean so i i owe it to my mother i think she helped me start off the journey and she's a financial education trainer herself uh, actually master trainer that's what we call her um and, and and i remember her saying to me you've got a knack for training so if you wanted i could teach you you know the easier courses you know the social finance courses because i see how you love to relate to people so maybe let's pick the social finance courses and that's how i started the journey in financial literacy so she picked a few courses financial literacy for youth initially and I loved the content, I related with it, I, you know, and then I just connected with it and I said, I'm going to run with this. But also because for me, um, I, I'm a process thinker and I, I love to articulate issues. So for me, money is, I know that money generally is problematic. But for me, it's like, I want to talk about it because it's problematic. <laughs> I think because of the way I'm made. <laughs> well, Shalom, I mean, that's very fascinating. But let me stop you there for now. We're going to take a short break and when we come back, we're going to talk a little bit more deeply about the issues and themes that are drawn out in Shalom's book. We can't wait to see you 
um, stay tuned. Welcome back. We are here in the studio on the Tando Book Club talking the personal finance game plan with Shalom Goero. So Shalom, let's get into some of the topics you uncover in the book. So one of the first things you have people do in the book is do a financial audit. And it's got a certain number of pillars, which you would find in any basic um, um, audit. And this kind of sets up the strategy for people entering or beginning their journey into financial freedom. Can you elaborate on some of those pillars and why it's important for us to have a good understanding of them? So the idea was that if you're going to start a strategy, you need to look at what areas are you struggling in? What are some of the gaps that you have? So the pillars are, are very easy. It's just four of them, income, spending patterns, uh, assets, and skills. So it's really to say you need to have a critical self-analysis of what you have before you start working on what you need um, you know, to get, you know, out of the personal finance game plan, so to speak. So I think um, the reason why I put it in also is because a lot of us don't really track some of these things. We don't track our income. We're not really sure of our spending patterns. We, we are like, you know, I think school fees is a problem, but we don't really know, <laughs> you know, like what's really happening in your, in your <laughs> expense side of things. You don't really want to look at that. So I really push you to do that. And then assets, there's so many of us who say we don't, I don't have anything. You know, I want to start a business, but I don't have anything. I don't have any money. I don't have anything. And then they've got like piles and piles of like expensive handbags and shoes that they're not wearing and all of that. Um, skills inventory. You know, what can you do? What 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 comes easily to you? Because that's important when you start the journey of working on your personal finances. Wow. I mean, that's a very um, intense conversation. Um, and obviously the audit is something that you can't just do like over a 30 minute coffee. Um, you really have to engage in it. And it's obviously something you have to keep coming back to every time you want to achieve a new financial level, I suppose. That's true. That's true. Because everything changes. Um, it actually came out of a conversation I had with someone about the net worth calculation. A lot of people don't like doing net worth calculation. but So, so that's why I then break, broke it apart and said, let's do it as a financial audit. It's pretty much the same thing. It's just I'm putting it in a different format so that it's not like, Hey, what are your assets? Why are your liabilities? Because that can be a bit, <laughs> it can jolt you out of your seat. So I wanted to make it slightly simpler. Well, it is simple and it's also very empowering because I think the skills audit is one of the things that lifts the person out of a um, self-recriminating conversation with themselves about finances. So mm -hmm. it also leads them to start thinking about what they should be doing more of. Exactly. That can, they can gain more value and how they can extract more value um, you know, in a sustainable and responsible way going forward. Exactly. So I do like the audit also better than the net worth um, calculation. I think it's also more honest in terms of assessing a person's worth. That's true. So there are some interesting um, statements that I loved from the book, which is money is a neutral commodity. The one who owns it has complete control. And another one, which is personal finance management is the battle of the mind. Many times we are fighting the limitation, limitations of our mindset. Um, and basically, I think one of the powerful things you talk about in the book is both how we can use our mind from a goal setting perspective to achieve financial wellness <laughs> and mm -hmm. wealth, but also some of the things we need to confront and address in our mindset, the obstacles that you so very eloquently and very well put down in the book. So what are some of the measures that you believe our viewers can adopt to cultivate the right mindset to be in the right position? Um, in financial literacy, in financial wellness, and in generating wealth? Number one, you need to learn. I think we, we look down on, you know, any sort of like money management courses because we're like, you know, it's my money. I'll just use it however I feel like. But if you learn, you learn, um, you know, if you've got the, the knowledge, the skills, and the tools that come from learning about money, then it becomes easier for you to sort of like do the practical things such as budgeting, saving and investing. Because also those three, which are which are seemingly very basic, are the ones that are the stepping stones towards wealth, wealth building and all of that. So I think the number one basic thing is learn. Learn as much as you can, you know, pick up a course, pick up a podcast, you know, <laughs> read. Um, you know, we're not good readers, especially when it comes to things about money, because we think, oh, you know, I don't have to read about it. I'll just kind of figure it out as I go. So do as much as you can to read and expose yourself 
to so much more information. And then also, secondly, is take advantage of free resources. Um, in Zimbabwe, our banks have got free financial advisory services. People don't know about this. I often say to people and they're like, no, it's not true. I'm like, just walk into a bank and say, I want to sit down and talk to a financial advisor. They will offer you those services as long as you are banking with them. Some of them, you don't even need to bank with them because they're also looking at that as an opportunity to get you to bank with them. So those sort of things are important because they open up your eyes to what is available for you in terms of financial services, financial products that can take you to the next level financially. So don't shy away. These financial institu institutions are there for you. They are there to serve you. And if they don't do so, you can even put it on Twitter, you know, put them on blast. So, yeah, those two, I think, are the main things that people need to start doing because we can work on our mindset if we are exposed. I think ignorance is our biggest challenge when it comes to money issues. Definitely. And yet we always allow ourselves to um, render um, emotional reasoning when talking about our finances. So this is something you and I chit chatted about before when we were talking about um, social finance. So we make de uh, money decisions from an emotional perspective, but in your book, you so strongly and very eloquently highlight that money is a neutral um, commodity. So our relationship or what we're getting out of m money is actually determined by how we are approaching it. And so I love what you're saying about ongoing learning and accessing all of those resources that are around us. And definitely, if we are um, banking with an institution, all those surface fees that we're paying, <laughs> I mean, we should just actually be asking questions in there. We should go in there and have a cup of coffee exactly. and be like, because you're paying for it. So yeah, we should be doing true. those things. So I think that that's very, very uh, powerful. And um, I find it also very interesting that um, uh, you don't just read one book and you know everything about money. And also reading an accounting textbook is the place to learn yeah. about personal finances Definitely and not. how to generate wealth. Well, we're coming to the end of the segment, but we'll be back shortly. Powerful insights there from Shalom on cultivating a good money financial mindset, learn, equip yourself, and how the three pillars of budgeting, saving and investing are kind of like the framework for having a lifelong journey of financial wellness. So we're going to take a short break right now, but stay tuned. We'll be right back with advice from Shalom about getting your voice out there from the perspective of publishing. You don't want to miss this. We're back for our final segment of the book club with Shalom Goero, and we're talking personal finances. And right now, we're going to get stuck into the conversation about publishing before we get a short reading from Shalom from her book. So, Shalom, why is financial literacy important for this generation of Africans? I think we are a very ambitious lot. I mean, we want to start the business, build the house, uh, you know, take kids to school all at once, right? So I think it's important for us to be financially literate so that we understand the value of, you know, prioritizing, the value of working through certain things, you know, and to also realize that there are foundational years. There are years maybe you may just be working on building the business. Um, and then there'll be a year where you'll be able to build that house. Um, and that can only happen when, you, when you're financially literate um, and you're able to set goals and prioritize the goals. Um, goal setting sounds like a very easy thing to do because people just think, oh, it's what I want. But it goes beyond that. It also tackles this issue of prioritizing. It tackles this issue of allocating necessary resources to the particular goal. So I think because we're an ambitious generation, we need to be financially literate so that the knowledge, the skills and the tools we, great, we gain from financial literacy can help us to organize and arrange our mm. lives in ways that are beneficial for us. So it's good for us to be ambitious. But we just need to make sure that we've got the right information that helps us to then build the life we want to live. A hundred percent. And there's nothing like summarizing your life plan with figures that are very unemotional um, and give you a quick snapshot of exactly where you are and where you want to go. Yeah. Um, so I love that, arranging our lives. So um, what was the publishing process like for you and what's your next project? So for me, I did my, I wrote the book initially, and then I thought to myself, I needed 
uh, like people to give me input on the actual book itself went, before it, it went to the publishers. Um, so the raw copy went to three particular people. Uh, one is a renowned author, Ignatius Mabasa. Um, he went through the book initially and he had serious questions for me to consider that changed some of the things that I had been saying to really mean what I meant. Mm. And then I have a good friend of mine called Heather. She went through the book as well. Um, but I feel like she did a great job of turning my raw book into something that's readable. Mm. Um, you know, she really has the eye for that. And then finally, I then took it to my husband as well <laughs> for him to just have a read through and say, hey, I agree with everything that's in here because you know some of our stories feature mm -hmm. in the book mm -hmm. and then finally I took it to the publishers and then they did the editing the proofreading as well as putting everything together to make sure that um, I think they call it developmental editing or something like that um, and then afterwards we had the book itself so yeah that was sort of my publishing process I, I got my um, what you, what's it called ISBN mm -hmm. number by myself um, I did the the book cover by myself um, so that was pretty much done by the time I then uh, went on to my publisher well I love I'm a fan of your um, book cover Thank um, you. I think that it was very well done and I think that um, there were a lot of good people that you found along the way I know Ignatius Mabasa he's a well-known um, uh, writer of both Shona and English um, love his work and I always find it interesting the um, viewpoint that a life partner can bring to your work. Um, often authors, when they show their work to their life partner, there's a whole new dimension that comes to it. And so I'm always like, if you're gonna write a book and you have a life partner, make sure that they also take a look at it before it goes out into yeah. the world. It's important. <laughs> I think your other question was, what's my next project, right? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so um, I'm writing uh, a bit of a controversial one coming up called Seven Money Conversations for Couples. And I'm delving into this whole minefield of family finance in a Zimbabwean context. And I think that's going to be pretty interesting. May just spark controversy all over, <laughs> but I'm excited about it, yeah. Well, I think that's the best way to kind of re restructure, restore our family um, sort of set up and breakdown. Um, one of the things you say in your book is Zimbabwe is a very peculiar environment. Um, but your book is also very encouraging about how to extract value from our finances within that environment. Yes. And it starts in the family, um, because one of your earlier stories in the book are of you, when you were still in school, the story of two personalities, you and Judah, and I love yes. that story. Um, so I really, really, really um, appreciate um, this next book that you're doing, and I can't wait to review it on the book club. Sure thing. I'll bring it through. <laughs> okay, so before we have the reading from the book, quickly, just very, very quickly, Shalom, what advice would you give to young budding writers? Ooh, um, number one, set a schedule. I think as creatives, we kind of like, oh, we'll see how it goes. But I think set a schedule, have like a, this is my launch date, then work backwards. Um, so I've given my my plan for writing and editing and everything and the marketing side and everything to my publisher, Sympathy, you know her. Mm -hmm. um, so she kind of checks on me um, once in a while. How's it going? How are we? How far are we? Um, so if you have a schedule, it keeps you accountable. Um, and then secondly, I think uh, it's, it's, you need to make sure that you spend enough time with the with what you've written yeah. so reading it often and rewriting and rethinking um, and then also make sure you have enough eyes on it before yeah. you take it to the publisher because that will also refine what you've written and bring out more value out of what you've written well that's wonderful shalom so let's hear from you from your reading um, that you've prepared for us today and um, what are you reading uh, for us? And why do you believe women need to hear this right now? So I'm reading from the book, The Personal Finance Game Plan. Um, it's towards the end. And I think it kind of sums up what we're talking about today. Okay. So it says, I understand that money is often a difficult topic for many to engage in. This is probably because it evokes a myriad of emotions. Consequently, it is also many times the root of conflict in relationships. In the Zimbabwean context specifically, money is arguably political too. The political environment has had a profound effect on the economics of our nation. This further conflates the complexity of the topic. 
Objectively, it renders any conversations around money difficult, but not utterly impossible. Money management is not easy, but not applying wisdom in your money management is costly. So start today. Don't wait until you've accumulated large amounts of money. Start working on your game plan today. Better still, pick up one financial discipline and put it into practice. Well done. Amazing and powerful, powerful note to end the show on. Thank you. Well, it's been another edition of the Book Club with our guest Shalom Goero profiling her book, The Personal Finance Game Plan. See you again next week, same time, with another fabulous African female author. Until then, stay safe, stay strong, and stay true. Goodbye.